Good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Lopez. I think I know most of you, and I'm the director, the director of the School of English and University Pathways at RMIT, based in Saigon. This is a big week for RMIT, and I'm so glad to be up here in Hanoi for a few reasons. The first, of course, being graduation. I'm so excited to celebrate our graduates tomorrow and all that they've achieved thus far in their RMIT journey. <clears throat> I'm also here to connect with you all, our Hanoi colleagues, and our guests from Melbourne as well, our leaders, including Peggy. And of course, I'm here to meet some of our accomplished and esteemed alumni. We've got Ben and Loy today. Apologies. I thought there was going to be a podium, so I'm a little bit awkward. <laughs> It's also my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful event, a yet another fantastic collaboration between RMIT Vietnam and the Australia Vietnam Policy Institute. Today, we turn the spotlight on a very important topic, women's economic empowerment. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by RMIT Chancellor Peggy O'Neill AO, as well as, yes, we can clap, yeah. <laughs> as well as two of our very accomplished RMIT alumni, who I will introduce soon. At RMIT, we believe that universities have a number of important roles to play in the communities that we serve. And one of those roles is age old. It's about playing, <clears throat> it's about playing host to discourse, to challenging the status quo, and when required, to escalate the pace of change in the areas that matter most. This is why conversations like the one we're about to have are so important. For more than two decades, RMIT has been, this, has been a part of these types of conversations in Vietnam. And now this, in the 50th year of diplomatic relations between Australia and Vietnam, RMIT's commitment to Vietnam only gets deeper and stronger. Through the work of AV, AVPI, of which RMIT is a proud fan, founding partner, we actively bring together Australian organizations that share interests in Vietnam. The goal being to learn from one another and to work as a collective on ties, trade, and investment. We also support Australian and Vietnamese cha business champions in their pursuit of proactive engagement and discussions around the two-way opportunities for trade and investment. Together, we're building greater momentum and people-to-people -people links that underpin the relationships between these two countries. To realize its ambitions, Vietnam will need to cultivate a new workforce, sorry, new workforce skills and support its people to develop insight and human capabilities that go hand in hand with the society in transformation. This is the role of RMIT Vietnam, because university experience is, 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 a, is as much about preparing for this, to contribute to society as it is for preparing for work. The rapid technological advances of the digital revolution have resulted in shifts towards higher value industries and services, with many existing jobs at risk of automation or significant change. At the same time, the demand for non-routine tasks requiring cognitive, digital, high-order, and socio-emotional skills will grow. This means, that there's an <clears throat> this means that there's an expanding need for Vietnam's future workforce to be educated, upskilled, reskilled, not only for the future of work, but for the future of society as a whole. And in this new, in this new landscape, both economic and social, has all the hallmarks of an environment where women's economic empowerment becomes a part of the natural order of things, as it should be. Education is fundamental to this, both as a pathway for in-demand skills and competencies that create socioeconomic prosperity, but also of equal importance as a place for women's voices to be heard and for their influences to build. Empower, empowerment is not something that occurs in a moment. It's something that it, that's achieved over a lifetime. On that note, it's my privilege to welcome RMIT Chancellor Peggy O'Neill, 
who has been at the helm of our university since the beginning of, of 2022. I've had the pleasure of meeting Peggy and learning more about her over the last few days, and her journey has been quite inspirational. Let me find my notes. Need to get this right. She was an officer of the Order of Australia in two th She was made an officer of the Order of Australia in 2019 in recognition to her service to football, superannuation, and finance law, and for the advancement of women's leadership roles. And she was named Melbourneian of the Year in 2021. Peggy has a lifetime of community and business achievements, including contribution across both government and industry to critical issues ranging from women's housing and equality to mental health and well-being. In Australia, she's famous, famous? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> For her presidency of the iconic Richmond football team from 2013 to 2022 and remains an active leader in her professional field of law. In her spare time, do you have spare time? <laughs> <laughs> she is also the chair of the Commonwealth Games Victoria 2026 Organizing Committee. Peggy, you are an inspiration, and on behalf of, uh, behalf of all of us, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Apologies again. Um, I'd also like to introduce our other panelists. Today we are joined by Bin Lei, Vander Van der Kirkov. Van der Kirkov. I really practiced that. <laughs> Apologies. It's okay, I'm still practicing. <laughs> I also have a challenging name, so apologies again. Bin Lei van der Kirchhoff, founder and managing director of ASART. Bin has <clears throat> a wealth of experience working in merger and acquisition transactions. There's a list, ranging from finance, tax, negotiation, politics, government relations, and advocacy. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Vin has assisted and advised many leading Vietnamese companies and multinational corporations in various industries with over 110 projects and 230 companies for a total value of 3.6 billion US dollars. Wow. Wow. Vin, thank you. And should I say welcome back as an RMIT alumni. <clears throat> I would also like to extend a welcome back to Loi Huang Ng. RMIT alumni, also an RMIT alumni, and brand director for Procter & Gamble. Loi has over eight years of international experience in the FMCG industry, from white space launches, business turnarounds, and media and e-commerce capability transformations. Loi is also the equality and inclusion advocator for Procter & Gamble, Leading equality in the, excuse me, leading Procter and Gamble's equality and inclusion initiative, as well as the vice chair of Vietnam American Chamber of Commerce's Women and Leadership Committee. Welcome. So today is really all about a chat to hear from our leaders, from our alumni around women's economic empowerment. And so we're going to open it up for a few questions to the audience in just a few moments. But before then, we'll get to know our panelists a little bit more. So first over to you, Peggy. You have a personal passion for the power of education and its ability to change lives. Connecting to your own story, can you tell us a little bit about how you see that life-changing potential here in Vietnam? Well, this is my first visit to the RMIT campuses, and um, I can find many parallels to my own story. I might tell you a little bit about that. Some of you have heard it. It, it hasn't all been, as you can tell from my accent and with yours, it hasn't all been in Vietnam, and it hasn't all been in Australia. Um, I was born in a small, very small, 150 people town in the remote Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. And I was the first person in my family to go to university. Um, but it was a time where that's very, it was a very poor community. And while my parents didn't, weren't able to pursue education for themselves, they always thought 
that that was the cornerstone of a new life. And um, so it was a time when many people didn't see why girls needed to be educated at all, uh, because after all, what were they going to do? They were, you know, everybody had a narrow focus about you're going to stay here. Uh, but especially my mother um, always said, you know, education can change your life and change all our lives in a generation. And when I think back on my life, and here I am speaking to you, um, I think, boy, were my parents right? Um, so I see the potential of what education has brought to my life and what it's opened up. And I think that uh, no matter what the country, but seeing what RMIT is doing in Vietnam is um, uh, just another example of the world opens up to you and those possibilities. I, I am a lawyer by training. I went to um, law school and my first job out of university was in a law firm in Charleston, West Virginia, the state capital. And um, I was the 33rd lawyer. It was the biggest law firm in the state, but it's still not very big. Um, but I was uh, the first woman they had hired in their 100 year history. Um, so, <laughs> well, but before, before you applaud, I survived it, I'll just say it that way. <laughs> and thrived, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I look back and I think, well, what an experiment that somebody took a chance. And they didn't really, you know, know what to do with me, and I had no idea what to do with them. Um, but uh, little by little, we, we worked through it, and, um, and then, my life changed. One of the things, I, d I didn't see an ocean until I was 21. So it shows you sort of how landlocked, and people in Australia is especially, and probably Vietnam too, can't quite imagine. Um, we saw creeks and we saw lakes, but we didn't, I never saw an ocean. But I always had this curiosity that I think came through my education. Uh, there were so many things in the world happening, so many people doing such interesting things that I thought, I want to see that, I want to do that. So I, I started traveling, um, and in America, you know, the two-week vacation is about it. So uh, you don't get very far on that. But on one of those trips in Greece, I met an Australian backpacker, and I married him. <laughs> you know, as you do, you know, you meet somebody in a bar in Greece and you get married, <laughs> and your life changes too. But I think, but except for uh, having that curiosity that I think comes from knowing a bit more about the world. I probably wouldn't have been in Greece. I wouldn't have gone to Australia. And in a way, I wouldn't be here. Um, so I, I think that also says that education gives you um, perhaps a bit more knowledge about yourself. And you know when things come along that maybe I should, maybe I should take that opportunity. Maybe I should walk through that door. Um, and sometimes you also have then the knowledge to say, oh no, that's not for me. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, so that was sort of the way it was, and, and in those small towns, there were probably two things that people were really interested in. I mean, the social life revolved around sport on Fridays and the weekend, and um, on church, and those were the two social outlets. And, um, and at that time, besides women, girls not getting education, there were no sporting uh, opportunities either. In a town that small, there's one sporting field and the boys have it all the time. Um, but I was a great spectator and I came to love sport and I um, sort of didn't think too much about it. I got into academics and I um, went to law school and I just studied all the time. But somewhere in the back of my mind, I realized that when I was watching sport, I sort of turned into a different person. <laughs> and, um, and then when I moved to Melbourne, uh, I moved with inside of the Melbourne Cricket Ground, and some of you have been there know it's a, the big stadium, one of the best in the world, and it's within inside of my house. And uh, I moved to the suburb of Richmond, and I, it turned out everybody in Melbourne had a team that, um, that played and that was very tribal about who you supported. And so I thought, well, like many immigrants in places, I picked the team that had the name of my suburb. And uh, so that was the beginning of my involvement with Richmond and we were not very good and we were very, um, <laughs> very poor administrators. And then over time as I got more involved, um, I was asked if I would join the board, which again was one of those poison chalice. You think, gee, we don't have any money. We haven't won in a very long time. <laughs> uh, but I thought, again, I was the first woman. And I thought, 
sometimes you just have to say, I love, I love this board, I'm finding something I'm really interested in. And, um, and the worst thing that can happen is I'm no good. The worst thing that can happen is I go back to exactly what I was doing before. And so lots of times that's what I've always thought is, don't, don't worry too much about, it. the fear of failure I think is just the price you pay for doing something new and trying to do something great. And everybody has it, but you can't let it stop you. And if you fail, or if it do, you don't achieve to the level you want, you're none the worse off. You've had the experience, and you go back to doing what you did before. So sports had become a big part of my life by then, too. And I thought, there's the law I love, sport that I love. And then in recent four or five years, I've, these opportunities to be involved in education have come my way. I was on the Fulbright Commission for Australia for a couple of years. Um, and that sort of came out of the blue, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. And then on the heels of that came this um, search firm asking if I'd be interested in being considered to be chancellor of RMIT. And I said, are you, are you sure <laughs> that it's me? The last time I was at the university, I was a student. Um, but uh, I thought, you know, maybe the world's telling you something here. Maybe this is the next thing. And, and I started really uh, thinking about the value of education to me and what it has meant to my family. It's a very long-winded answer. You asked me one thing, and, uh, but I hit on the things that I love. So, um, uh, so that's how I came to be involved with RMIT. And, um, and while I was president of Richmond, in four years we won three of the premierships. So that, that made me very popular, but I think we were the same people who were losing, but then you turn things around and you start to win if, you're, um, if you make good decisions. And I think that's probably every business. You want to make the best decision you can, and, or at least try to make neutral decisions and not try to make bad decisions. And then because of that, uh, I was asked this year, well, like last year, um, to chair the Commonwealth Games for the state of Victoria for our 2026, um, which, which is a totally new model, so that's a bit scary too, because um, we're gonna do it in the regions of Victoria rather than in the capital cities, and that's never been done before. Um, so there's all the logistic issues you would expect, and that's why we need all the business people to tell us how to do it. And we have a, our CEO is um, a wonderful man who ran all the COVID uh, compliance for Victoria, and before that he made the trains run on time. So I think he's probably pretty good <laughs> on it most of the time. So, uh, so anyway, you can see I think education has just enriched my life to, um, I, I could talk forever, but I'll stop. <laughs> All right, well thank you, Peggy. And welcome back to education. Thank you. <laughs> education in this capacity, but I think what your story really tells us is that education is a lifelong journey. And, and whether or not you're working in the industry or not, it's something that we learn from, whether it's the risks we take, the activities we take, and the w businesses we join and lead, and of course the, the, the education that we continue um, at a university as well. All right, Ben. We'd like to know more about you as well. So as I said, Ben has over 13 years of experience working in mergers, acquisitions, finance, accounting, tax, just to name a few. What has your experience been as a woman in finance, a predominantly male-dominated field? Can you take us through your own journey from the start of your career to now being the founder and managing director? Oh, um, thank you. Thank you for having me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, it's an it's a, it's a overall uh, kind of reflection. Um, I just want just to carry a little bit what uh, Ms. Peggy O'Neill here just shared about the importance of education. Uh, it just took me back uh, to my own memory lane um, where my, I remember uh, very clearly and vividly uh, my parents were very passionate about how it is important for me to get an education, how it's important to to have all of their children to go to universities. Um, uh, at the end, they got four out of five people got to university, and I'm the last person of the, of the family. Uh, all of them are um, uh, fully Vietnamese educated, uh, so they went to universities in Vietnam by Vietnamese. Um, I was the one who thought to my mind that in, at that time, I remember I was an eighth grader, and I thought to myself, if I did not learn uh, English, I would be fall behind. 
uh, and I knew that English was the way forward for me in the future. I was very bad in English. Uh, I, I remember I used to copy of uh, my friends uh, for the test in English. But, um, and it's, it's true, I, 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 I am happy to admit it now uh, because I'm, I'm okay in English now, so I'm okay, I'm okay to admit that. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I make a request to my parents, and at that time we were not very well to do family. We were just barely make a living. Um, and I told my parents, I said, I really want to improve English, and I had to go to good school. And good school costs money but I, I want you to help me. So I, I, can, I managed and convinced my parents to put a lot of money for me to learn English, and that's how I started my journey uh, with, with the educa English educated uh, education um, and school. And um, when I, just a little bit back, um, I decided, when I got a scholarship to the US for, for, for my high school, and then when I came back to Vietnam, I was thinking, okay, I was just on a summer break before coming back to Indiana University uh, in, the, in the U.S. And I stumbled into RMIT Vietnam, and that was uh, 2006. Uh, I visited the campus. Uh, I listened to uh, the, the, the description of the program. And I thought to myself, I did not have to go anywhere, I'm, I would be happy to be there, which I did, and it was one of my best decisions. Uh, I think uh, one of the best things I got out from RMIT Vietnam is the, 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 the opportunity to be truly international, and the quality uh, of, the, of the work that I did and the, the, the lesson that I learned, uh, to my knowledge back then, I felt it was pretty much the same if I would get it in the US. So I think it's important and it's a great opportunity for so many Vietnamese uh, and so many people that's living in Vietnam that have this kind of uh, uh, campus and, 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 and place to get their education. And I'm so glad and so happy that still seeing RMIT Vietnam growing strong every, every day for the last 15, 14, uh, years. Um, 23. Yeah, but for starting from my perspective. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, that was when since I appreciate RMIT and still after uh, so many years and I'm already into the workforce, uh, RMIT University is still very strong. Um, and RMIT actually gave me a great uh, entrance and, and path to where I am today. Um, we, we used to have great program. I do not know if the, still now uh, is the program where we have uh, activities open up to talk with the companies and industries. And I got a chance to meet with people from, our, um, from KPMG and I joined KPMG uh, through that opportunities. I got multiple offers from multiple big four firms and multiple companies, which is a fantastic opportunity for any students that graduate from RMIT. And I think this is one of the biggest uh, values that RMIT should keep and, and embracing. Um, so I joined um, and I start my career um, uh, in audit. And then I move a little bit to word strategy. Um, and later, I decided um, corporate finance, specifically mergers and acquisitions, uh, fundraising are the sweet spot for me, where it's balanced out the, between the, the numbers and the strategies and the markets and the future direction of companies. So I, I stuck with it for ever since. Um, and uh, overall, I'm very happy uh, with, with uh, what I, I decided to do. And um, uh, it's true indeed in our industry, um, when we start, we have many women. So you got, you know, start out fresh from college, you got a lot of assistants, you got a lot of, you know, first kind of level uh, professionals. But when we move up the change, uh, I start to not seeing female face. Uh, more anymore. I, I usually now out my work is when I walked into a ballroom 
Uh, usually it will be 29 men and me as a woman. Or we, um, or two, one or two, maximum will be two people. Um, that's, that's with a female representation. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's more into of, um, uh, it's not too much about people intentionally um, make less women in the industry. It's just uh, the, the characteristic of the industry itself um, and the, the passion and the desire to work in the industry. So um, here I am, five years ago, I decided to start my own firm, uh, Azad, specifically specializing in mergers and acquisitions and uh, helping companies uh, to prepare themselves uh, and also uh, work on their corporate finance and corporate strategies uh, in Vietnam. And our clients are um, usually uh, top or uh, um, uh, in the top three of the, of the industry that they are in. Um, we're very proud to be to advising many leading clients in, the, in Vietnam and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, uh, if you ask me um, the success of today, I wouldn't say success as a success, but at least I made my way to uh, where I really want it to be and building a company that I can be proud to, to, to give advice to, uh, to, to people and uh, to companies. Um, I would always look back and reflect on where I started. And where I started was the opportunities of education uh, the opportunities to be able to join the workforce in the, from the correct angle and from the right entrance. Uh, and it saved me a lot of time and struggles. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to go directly to what it could help me uh, to advance in my career. So that's, I hope it's answered the question and I am sorry it's been too long. <laughs> So I'll, I'll come back in just a few minutes, but I want to build on this conversation and getting to know each other. So I want to hear from Loy first. Um, connecting to your own personal journey as well. Um, Loy, one of your responsibilities at Procter & Gamble is in digital and e-commerce transformation. And you are also the company's diversity and inclusion lead. So again, connecting through your own journey, what changes around gender equality have you seen or made in the workplace? particularly as we're seeing this space grow in Vietnam. All right. Uh, so first of all, good morning, uh, students, teachers, and distinguished guests of RMIT Vietnam. It has been so long that I get to say the word uh, teachers uh, <laughs> in my conversation. So first and foremost, it's always nervous to speak in front of your teachers. And now, I, for today, I get to speak in front of the chancellor. So <laughs> I think uh, along the way I may uh, get a nervous breakdown, but hopefully uh, I will be uh, doing okay. So uh, before I answer um, Eureka's question, I just wanted to share with you right, the reason why I'm such a big supporter of uh, diversity and inclusion in general and specifically for women empowerment. So there are actually three reasons. The first one, uh, which is uh, very near to my heart, it started with my mother. So I share with Ben and Manuela uh, on the way when we uh, came to RMIT that uh, my mom is a traditional uh, Chinese Vietnamese uh, uh, woman. So she and her family migrated to Vietnam uh, 50 years ago. Um, and life had been very difficult for her. Um, and um, so that was one. Second one was that um, I, I grew up in a broken family. So when we were young, uh, my mom worked very hard, very, very hard to support her three sons to go to school. Um, and, um, and she didn't know how to even read Vietnamese because her parents were Chinese. Um, so uh, when I see her working very hard, I was asking her, what can I help her with? Right? And she was telling me, uh, you just need to go study. So uh, they help. Go study have always been um, the, the things right that she really want us to do. And she worked very hard to support us to go to school. And this is where I believe that education uh, can ch change life and change the mindset of the, the people. So that is one. 
Second one is uh, you hear a lot about Eureka mentioned about my work rate as um, as a PNG. So PNG is a, a, man, a global manufacturer. We sell uh, consumer goods, and especially uh, our, mo our the biggest uh, client of, uh, of our client is actually uh, a woman around around the world. Um, um, they are the one who take care of the family from both um, the financial side, but also the um, um, household size of the of the family. So most of our um, our target consumer actually female, and I was myself uh, working on a paper category, uh, selling both paper di baby diaper and also uh, women feminine pads. Uh, so that was the reason why I truly connect and resonate with uh, what the women have been through in their daily life, right? Um, even when it comes to their uh, period. And last but not least, one of the reasons uh, I was such a supporter of diversity and inclusion is because myself, I'm a LGBTQ+, uh, and I'm engaged with my partner, and uh, <laughs> we are living together uh, back in Saigon. Uh, so that was the reason why I'm such a big supporter of diversity and inclusion. Uh, so that is the whole why. Now, uh, coming what, right? So if you look, if you talk, if you talk about diversity inclusion, there are two aspects of it. And I heard a saying from uh, uh, this lady named Meyer, of course, to avoid plagiarism, I need to <laughs> state the name correctly. So it's from Meyer, and she was saying that diversity is everyone will get a chance to be invited to the parties, but inclusion is where you're being asked to dance. Um, so that's, that is simple as that is, but I think uh, diversity and inclusion in the workplace, right? Um, there are two different aspects, and, and these two aspects are being measured uh, very differently. One is very uh, quantitative, and the other one is very qualitative. So diversity is right, the way that uh, most of the corporate and even P&G measure diversity is uh, very numeric. So we will look at our uh, workforce, right? the organization, and we'll have this kind of ratio that we need to ensure equal representation of uh, female and male in the organization. So that is simple stuff. So that is what we're achieving for. So when it comes to diversity, uh, especially in Vietnam, right, um, one of the, there are three things that we uh, do right. The first, I think we need to do right. The first one is actually having the right uh, policy and the right infrastructure to support the woman. So it can be uh, as big as uh, we need to ensure um, the non-bias job description, right, when you do job posting, in, uh, rather than saying that this, this, sales work, uh, this sales that you need to work in the field. Uh, so that's why we need to re uh, require a, a male uh, um, applicant. So we avoid that, uh, so that is number one. Number two is that we need to ensure that we have an equal pay policy right, for males and females, no matter uh, what their gender. Um, if they are doing the same job, then they should be paid equally. So these are two um, things that is very, this style very big, but one of the other simple things, right? especially uh, in a developing country like Vietnam, uh, sometimes you even forget about this, but um, uh, it's actually infrastructure. So for us, right, having a male and female toilet is, is a norm. Everybody uh, have it, and of course, RMIC would have it. But if you go um, 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 uh, closer right, to the rural area of Vietnam, it may not be the case. And this, this is not the case for some of our female uh, sales uh, executives, that they need to work in the uh, uh, rural area in our distribu distributor office. So one of the things that we did uh, when I take on the initiative is to actually ensure that we are having a separate males and female toilet that have feminine pad inside the female toilet for the female um, employees to use. So that can be simple at that. So that is the first R. The second R is actually all about recruitment. And, um, and just to share with you all, um, one insight about Vietnam is that if we look at the history of Vietnam right, uh, with, uh, in the past 2000 years, uh, Vietnam have always been uh, going to war in the past uh, 2000 years. So uh, that, um, that being said, that is the primary reason why uh, the wife right, or the female in the family has always been the forefront of uh, taking care of the family both from a financial standpoint and as a mother. Um, 
and uh, um, and so that is why this is, uh, if you look at the commercial side aspect of every business, it is very easy to hire a female finance, or it is very easy to find to farm to hire a female uh, HR, but it gets extremely difficult uh, to uh, hire a female in STEM industry, and the reason uh, is that if you look at my, you must, you guys must be more uh, familiar than me. Is if you look at the STEM um, uh, um, uh, students, right? Um, uh, less than 10% of them are actually female, and the problem uh, become worse is that when the female uh, register for STEM um, a curriculum, their parents in the next four years of uh, university will the only re the only aim in go in my for the parents actually to bail them out from STEM and working in other or studies or other things like marketing or HR. Um, so one of the things that we did is that we, um, we uh, uh, participate with a university like RMIT uh, to provide number one, STEM scholarships so that we can further increase the pool. But also um, uh, this mentorship program, right, whereby uh, we get each of our STEM employee to connect to build that personal relationship uh, at a very young age. So that they see uh, this is a step case and what they can become when they work with STEM. Uh, so, that is, uh, so that is all about the recruitment that we do. Uh, the last thing, and I think it's resonated with all the women here, is, uh, is about retention, and especially retention after uh, 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 post maternity. And the reason is simple as such for women, right? For male, it is very easy for you to have children because you are not the one, uh, we are not the one who bear the, 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 the children, right, nine months. And then we are not the one who take care of them at least um, closely in the next uh, uh, 18 years. So especially for, uh, for female employees, one of the biggest uh, decisions, right, that they need to make uh, throughout their entire life is to choose either their career or to take care of their family when they, after they give birth. So one of the things that we did is that um, we have this uh, nursing program whereby we actually giving a monet monetary incentive for the uh, female employee so that they can um, uh, have better financial support to uh, take care of the family either to hire a nanny if they're not very comfortable uh, going to work uh, without, without anyone looking at their baby. And also they ha we have this um, pro uh, program whereby we link them to a psychology, uh, psychology doctor whereby they can have a one-on-one -on -one consultant to get, to get them pass through this difficult, life, uh, difficult life stage. So that is the thing that we do to improve the diversities uh, in our organization. So now moving to the next aspect which is <laughs> inclusion. Uh, this gets extremely difficult because now we're not dealing with numbers anymore. We're actually dealing with human behavior and feeling. And that is a very qualitative uh, metric to measure. So we have this uh, annual survey, right, whereby we, we actually ask a few questions on our employee, uh, regardless of their gender, is, uh, uh, on inclusion, is that are you your true self at work? Um, and in order to ensure that, we are actually doing three things. Um, and and um, um, the first thing is to actually create this safe space, right? Uh, an inclusive workspace for all the employees. Um, and it can be simple as such, we created a leaning circle, especially for the women, together with some of the female leader like been in the company, that they can have a very casual talk. It can be simple as such, how do I get my boss to raise my salary up? Um, uh, so that's very uh, safe space right, for women to... <laughs> so that, well, that is how we created a safe space for our female employee uh, to look after each other. But uh, one of the things that we do more on a bigger scale is actually this, uh, what we call inclusive behavior training. Because, because if you look at uh, inclusion, right, um, and this is come to uh, bias or uh, discrimination, and usually bias and discrimination happen very unconsciously uh, because we didn't realize it, we don't understand it, we don't know how to say it. So that's why we make a judgment, right? That can be bias uh, toward a woman. So this is where I believe that uh, having an inclusive behavior training will help at least establish 
uh, to both the males right, and other employees how to understand women, how to treat women right. And this can be example as women on their period. right. The men need to understand why the women feel that way when they're on that period so that um, if, they, if they need to take a short break or be on personal leave, or um, then uh, this is more understandable for a male a manager right, to give this permission uh, for the female to take a rest uh, on day that she's having a period at uh, her um, a sick leave rather than her personal leave. So that are some of the things that uh, we embrace, um, uh, equality, diversity and inclusion in our workplace. Very comprehensively, thank you. I have so many questions for, for all of you, accomplished leaders um, in, in your industries and, and, and connection to RMIT, but I do want to give some time to our students um, and our staff who might have questions for the panel as well. So there are a couple of microphones out there if you do have a question. Um, thanks so much, panel. My name's Amy. I um, am head of comms at RMIT, so um, thank you for giving us your time this morning. Great, insightful answers. Um, we're very lucky being staff at RMIT. We're surrounded by young people and students every day, and I would like to get your thoughts on how do we get, you know, what is your advice of encouraging young people talking about women's empowerment. What can we do? Um, what are your advice to young people about the conversations about empowering women? Thank you. I'll turn this first over to Ben. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. It's a, it's, it's a very difficult question because, uh, and, and when my first thought of hearing your question is that uh, maybe we don't talk about it, maybe we just do, you know? Um, for, for young, if I got to give advice to young women or uh, um, uh, young female students uh, about how to, how to raise power and uh, woman empowerment or how to um, make people notice of their presence and their worth, the best thing to do is to work hard, prove yourself, and show to the world that you are no less than any man uh, out there. So that that would be that would be my the, my first thinking in in in, in any discussion. Um, the the rest, I believe, is is uh, is mostly top down uh, for for any organization to start. Um, because this is a very personal matter, and I think uh, very little we can do uh, by saying, okay, I'm a woman, I need help, can you help me? And uh, I think the chance of anybody to say that or to speak that up is very little. Uh, the chance very much of you know, going from the top and from the surrounding, uh, saying, okay, do you need help? Uh, you struggle with your children, what can we do for you? Right? Or, you just freshly married, is there anything we can help? So, I mean, a lot of things we can do, uh, but from, from the internally for, for a female person, I would advise to don't seek for recognition, oh, I mean not recognition, but don't seek for fairness for women, just do and prove that. Uh, from, from, the, from the external uh, point of view, I would think it's more of a top-down and the surrounding organization that's supporting. Um, th this kind of initiatives. I, I might say, I think that for young women, I think one of the assumptions we're all, we've all made here, it's good business to have women included. And when it comes down to the opportunities, the new opportunities are coming with a new economy, it's a perfect time for young women to find a place that they enjoy and a topic they enjoy, a career that they enjoy, and equip themselves for that. Uh, but I think uh, it's wonderful to hear your comments and what Procter & Gamble are doing. Um, but I think it's something that 
women can't be the ones who try to solve it for women. I think it's something that everybody has to advocate, and you're exactly right, it has to come from the top. Um, there was um, a saying from our previous sex discrimination commissioner in Australia, and she said, if you don't deliberately include people, you can unintentionally exclude, which goes back to that um, you know, discrimination and bias that you're not even aware of. Um, so I think if you're a young woman, it might look daunting, but uh, I think it, and it's the pace of change has been really slow. Um, but I think there is an opportunity now and the demand for workers who can do all these uh, amazing things that are happening. You could be the one that helps solve some of that. But I think all of us have to be advocates and all of us who are in a position to uh, drive that change. But if it's not going to happen from the top and if the men in power don't agree to share some of that, it's not going to happen. But those businesses will not prosper. And I think that all the studies have showed that having women and having different opinions around the table just makes for better decision making and businesses are more likely to prosper. So. Any other, qu oh, Julia? James, the Dean of the uh, School of Communication Design. I was very interested in your take on uh, retaining women after they've had children. And I wondered, sometimes it's not just about supporting the women. Um, I was very unique in that I went to work, my husband stayed at home. And sometimes I think it's got to also be about empowering the men to say that's okay, because I know my husband faced a lot of prejudice because he made that decision. Um, so I just wondered, are you doing anything in your uh, company to empower men to look after children? Thank you. So um, exactly um, um, to what um, she just said, right, I think one of the big barriers um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, equality and inclusion um, is actually the roles of the, the husbands and the men in the families, right? And um, usually, when we talk about um, diversity and inclusion, we, um, most of us, right, 90% of the time, would think that we should create a platform for the woman to uh, stand on and support them. But 10% um, of the time, um, uh, very rarely, this is sometimes uh, that I believe that we need to get the men to, um, to um, step upward and help their families as well. So one of the things that I did uh, this year is that we launched this parental leave um, for um, the families, right? And that is applicable for not only the male um, employee, but also LGBTQ plus employee when you have children either adopted, um, a surrogate, or it is your uh, newborn child, that you will be entitled to eight weeks of leave um, uh, to take care of the families and support your, um, your uh, wife, especially in that difficult um, uh, post-trimester uh, period. And, and I think why this is such a meaningful, right, is because um, in Vietnam, we are not bound by law to give the men that parental leave. In fact, this is actually a company um, um, uh, um, 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 investment, right, in terms of um, uh, resources to have that eight weeks of leave for the men. And, um, and why we're doing that is because we uh, sincerely believe that the men themselves do want to take care of their family, especially post that trimester. You know, you can ask yourself who doesn't want to see their wife and their baby, right, after they, uh, they was born. So that was one of the things that I think is very small, just eight weeks of sleep, but makes a significant uh, um, milestone, right? Uh, memorable milestone for uh, the, 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 the male uh, employees of our company. All right, last question, Christine. I was just going to add into that, uh, uh, that question um, because it resonates with, with what I have experienced. Uh, so six years ago, I, I, we, we had a baby and uh, I experienced a lot of, and that was when I start to see all the discrimination, not, not maybe not intentionally, just uh, people just uh, in the mindset toward pregnant women. So I start being stopped of traveling for work just because I was just three months pregnant because people think that if something, if I would give birth, the project would not be done. Um, and you know, <laughs> even though if the project is only two two months, 
and I was like three months pregnant, and they said, no, no, don't put her on the airplane, she cannot fly, and I was like, I'm only three months pregnant. I can fly, and I was still flying to Sabah until my, my ninth month, so I, I, was, I, I did not understand why people have that mentality. Um, so, and when we start a new project, we were like, no, don't get her involved because she's gonna give birth soon. I was like, it's two weeks time. I, I'm not gonna give birth in two weeks. But <laughs> small things like this start to make me feel, oh my God, people just treating me like, you know, I'm, I'm a balloons and I'm gonna pop anytime. Uh, I love the, the, the feeling of attention, but to certain points, right? And when I gave uh, birth to my baby, uh, I start to realize time fly by very fast, and the companies is urgently want me to get back to work, um, given that we got six months uh, leave in Vietnam. Um, and by, at that time, I asked my husband, can you help just one week or two weeks, you know, and, and you can just take your annual leave. And he said, no, I cannot take leave. I said, but I, I took six months leave for this, <laughs> right? Like, um, so this is the, I think the way to help with this is to change our structure. We, we gotta change the structure and the policies when we do advising policy, we gotta change it. Because if we can talk a lot, but if the structure is not changed, is not enable, we cannot do anything. So it's very important. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons also I decided to start my own company uh, right after when my baby was only four months uh, old because I think that uh, I love my job, but the current structure at that time were not allowing me to be able to have that flexibility uh, with, with the work that I love. Um, and I'd rather to uh, do it uh, in my, my own um, uh, way and flexi flexibility. And that's why I start. And um, I think at least the companies, uh, if the company keep, if all companies, not just particularly the company that I was working for, I think if we're going on with this kind of structure and mentality, um, then companies will just keep losing their good people and the people who want to do the job, but the, the schedules or the, the, the things just do, does not allow her to do or allow her husband to do if we got the right structure in place. Um, so, so I think it's really important um, it, unintentionally, unintentionally uh, companies create their own competitors create their own threats by not treating the 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 right element the the right factor well enough, uh, and this is what we can circle back to say about sustainability. Imagine a world where every woman, every pregnant woman, after giving birth, have to quit and find her own way or creating her own company. It we will have the world of so many companies that's not effective or, and then uh, it's, it's not sustainable that way. And uh, I really share your, your, your emotion with your husband willing to take the decision and I applaud him for it and I think it's really important. And I think equally, we usually say men don't care, but I think they equally care. Mm. And they care more than us um, in, in some of the time. So I, 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 I really applaud men who, who bold enough to say, and I think they're very strong. Those are the people are very strong. They, they're strong enough to say, okay, I, I take this decision. I don't care what other people are saying. Right? But of course, when you hear too much about prejudice, about your decision, of course, it change, it's, it's impact you a little bit. But I think we, we're getting there. I, I want it to be faster, but uh, faster or not, it's, it's, it's on us, on people like us to advocate and to calling for policy changes uh, to make it happen. Thank you, Ben. And that's a fantastic message to end on. If there are any more questions, we're about to break for, for some networking and some lunch. So I think you can ask our guests those questions then. So thank you to our panelists for your insightful responses and to our, our audience for asking some, some great questions and more to come as well. It's been such a great opportunity, op opportunity to learn from you, to learn about your histories and your experiences, as well as your contributions and your visions forward as well.
It's such an important topic, women's economic empowerment. And you're right, it, it takes everyone. It's not just women, and it's not just men, and it's not just the top down. It's the entire, it's, the, it's, it's all of us that, that have a part to play. Um, and we all benefit when we all succeed as well. So thank you. And now I think we're breaking for a bit of lunch and networking.